Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, this Friday, Donald Trump will be sworn in as the 45th President of the United States of America. Many say he owes his victory to a greater mastery of the tools of this digital age. Twitter, Facebook, and all the other forms of online communication. And U.S. intelligence agencies are saying that Russian intervention in cyberspace played a hand, too. Well, here in Britain, the Brexit campaign was acknowledged uh, to be far savvier in its use of social media than the Remain side. The Scottish Nationalist Online Army narrowed the gap in their independence referendum and helped drive out Labour in the 2015 general election. So, there's no denying the power of digital media, but it also poses a real challenge. How do you know what's true, what's fake in an online world with no editorial control or standards? And what is the effect on democracy of trolling, fake news, and the echo chambers created by algorithms. To debate this brave new world, we've assembled a digitally savvy front row of journalists, politicians, campaign advisors, techno wizards, think tank heavyweights, television executives, learned academics, all here in the flesh, not created in some virtual world. They are all too real. And you can join in on Twitter or online by logging on to bbc.co.uk slash the big questions. Follow the link to the online discussion. Lots of engagement contributions from our highly representative Uxbridge audience as well. Uh, well, um, Jamie Bartlett, if I may, uh, director at the Centre for the Analysis of Social Media, the very man, um, this has changed politics forever, hasn't it? For years we've been saying, how do we get young people, how do we get more people engaged? How do we stop them from being disenfranchised? We have done just that. It has got a lot more people engaged. There's no doubt about that. And it's not just uh, people tweeting and posting things on Facebook. Social media has been remarkably good at forming a bridge to get people into real-world politics as well. Various types of activism, marching, demonstrating, even voting. I think people are more likely to vote if they get involved in politics online. But all good. That is all good, and I think everybody here would acknowledge that's a very good thing. But, of course, it creates new problems. And those problems, I think, we're only just beginning to grapple with. I think it's making politics, in some ways, far more polarised, far more difficult to predict or control. In many ways, Donald Trump is the perfect politician for a digital age. We are overwhelmed with information, graphs and charts and infographics and tweets and retweets. And in those circumstances, we tend to go for whatever is the loudest, the most offensive, the most emotive. And that is why politics, I think, is becoming more polarised. It's creating more centres of power that we barely understand, huge tech companies that can control what we see online, uh, and we don't really know how they work. So while it's bringing more people into politics, it's not clear to me yet whether it's making politics any better. In fact, in some ways, it's making it but rather worse. Well, there's loads of issues there. I'm really looking forward to the next uh, hour or so. Helen, he makes some good points. Are people actually becoming better informed and more engaged? Because uh, a click of a mouse is one thing, but actually trudging up the stairwells of high-rises delivering leaflets on a cold February night is another thing entirely. I don't think we should denigrate the click of the mouse. I, mean, I, I think there's a... There's a culture in politics, particularly British politics, that politics must be painful. You've got to do something cold or long or boring or, or hard work. And what digital media have done is they've sort of democratised the act of political participation. So now there's very small acts of participation, liking something, clicking something. Indeed, the click of the mouse, which is, which is what's doing the work here. It's what's drawing people into politics. We shouldn't let go of that, um, even while we're kind of... Blame don't it denigrate the click, the click basically. Yeah, That's don't denigrate the click. Yeah, and it makes a difference. People feel they're making a difference. Yeah, but are they? They're only, they're only because of these algorithms which uh, send you your own uh, things that they think you will like. So basically it's that echo chamber, it's that bubble people talk about. You're only confronting, if that's the right word, your own opinions. There's no challenge. I 
don't think that's right. It, I mean, the true echo chamber would be just reading the Daily Mail in the 1930s or just watching one particular TV station in the US. Um, that would be a real echo chamber. And I don't think that the, of course, um, our, our, our social media environments are personalised by us and personalised by the social media platforms, and we need to kind of work against that. But I do think still that our kind of information environment, and there's research to show this, that people are exposed to more news sources on social media than people who don't use social media. Only the media. news sources they agree with, though. No, not necessarily. A more heterogeneous range of news really? sources on social media than they are in the offline world. We're very good at creating echo chambers outside social media, um, and I don't think we should forget that. Yeah, echo chambers aren't, there's nothing new about there's them. There's nothing oh, new about is that echo right? chambers. Well, I think, firstly, I mean, Facebook's a bit different, but Twitter, I think, we overblow its importance because only a very small section of the population are regularly using Twitter to talk about the world around them, and they tend to be younger and more affluent. If you take the Brexit, uh, the EU referendum, the people who are most likely to vote to leave mm -hmm. were people over the age of 65 who were the least likely to be on Twitter. So I think if we're talking about these grand political developments sweeping the Western world and putting it down to Twitter, then I think we're mistaken. I think the danger with people like me on the left of politics is we think, well, the mainstream media is biased against us. Most of the press supports the Conservative government. So let's retreat to, to Twitter. I think that's a mistake because most people, they come home at the end of the day, busy day, got jobs, got kids. They might listen to a bit of radio, watch the evening news, maybe flip through a newspaper. And that is how most people still get their news coverage. So you get a false impression of what's happening in the world, in a sense. Well, rather than all this, because Helen's saying you get all this information, you're better informed than ever. But in fact, you're saying there's something of a, a, a political mirage about it. I think when it comes to Twitter, I think on Facebook, we've got, look, you've got someone here who did an excellent job for the Conservatives. You won't <laughs> often hear me saying that about people on that <laughs> wing of British politics. But he did, because what they did with Facebook, it wasn't about joining Facebook groups, which is, again, just people who often agree with each other. What the Conservatives did is they targeted specific demographics, because millions of people use Facebook. They're not talking about politics again on Facebook. They're mm. clicking on photos, sharing funny mm. messages with friends. But they targeted adverts at specific demographics. That is very effective. But if people like myself, who are campaigners, think we can just send a few tweets going, Theresa May, yeah, a load of people will retweet that. But we, then we make the mistake of thinking, well, the rest of the country all of a sudden are full of the same enthusiasm as me, and that's not true. So Twitter has its use, it can mobilise campaigners, put issues on the agenda, but it isn't a substitute, unfortunately, for trying to have a strategy to deal with, yes, a very hostile press. The aforementioned Tom Edmonds in a moment, but Ellie, you want to come in at this point? Yeah, I think there was a point made earlier that uh, social media, which I think is a great new tool, it's just another kind of technological advance in the way that people can communicate with each other, and that's to be welcomed. Um, makes it uh, politics harder to control or makes politics more polarised. I think most of us, um, myself included, would uh, welcome that because having uh, more ability to have an argument, having more scope to have a debate and have more people involved in the conversation is always a positive. Certainly, Twitter is a very kind of closed shop in the way that it's mainly young people and media commentators, myself as journalists, know that. Um, and Facebook, as, some, as Owen said, is a bit different. But the idea that this should be what, what kind of frightens me more about social media isn't necessarily uh, who's on it and who's talking about it. It's the attempts to control it, the attempts to make Facebook and, social media and Twitter put out certain messages or be worried about what messages they're put out and kind of the, the drive to censor social media is something that we're supposed to be That's a fascinating about. area. I'm going to address that a little bit later on because we will have lots to, lots to focus on there with the trolling, with the vile abuse, uh, with the fake news, with the, with the false news and all that. That's all to come. But you were mentioned, Tom, in dispatches <laughs> by Owen Jones in a congratulatory tone because of the brilliant uh, strategy that you came up with for the Tories in the last election online. What did you do and how did you do it? Well, broadly, political parties use online communications for two things. Uh, so the first thing is to find and recruit supporters who will go and take those vital actions to support them, pr primar primarily offline, as other panel members uh, have mentioned. So it's the people who are going to go knock on the doors because nothing beats that face-to-face -face communication. Um, the second thing they do, uh, and we did in the 2015 campaign, is to find and reach out to those swing voters mm -hmm. in the marginal seats that are going to decide that election and speak to them about the issues they care about. Now, if you imagine an election campaign, you're speaking from um, anyone from as diverse as Lib Dem voters in the South West to uh, Labour voters uh, in the north of England uh, and in Scotland as well. So you need to speak to them about issues they care about. Now, what Facebook allows you to do 
is find those groups of individuals and speak to them about the issues. You can't have to work quite hard to find Labour voters in Scotland, but there we are. <laughs> Nowadays, yes. <laughs> so that's what you did. Very, very targeted, very focused and very successful. Very targeted, very segmented communications. Now, um, digital in itself is just a medium, so you need to have the message right before you go uh, and speak to these people. There's no point mm. finding individual groups of people and speaking about things they don't care about. So there's no point finding groups of people finding groups of young voters and then speaking to them about pensions or um, about issues they don't care about. So it's about finding groups of people, having the right message and getting it in front of them time and time again. Mm. And it was, uh, Helen, it was remarkably successful in the marginals, wasn't it? Well, it was. And if you, uh, and I think also very successful uh, for the Leave campaign in Brexit and very successful for Trump. Because after all, if you, if you just reach an echo chamber of people who agree with you, you're not going to make any difference. I mean, that's not, that's not what parties are looking to do. They're looking to find people who are undecided or don't know what they think yet. Uh, and what Labour did at the last general election, as you know better than me, is it just randomly throw out the same message across yeah. Facebook. Yeah. So it didn't target specific people in specific seats they needed to win over. And also they mistook engagement, that's lots of people liking, commenting, mm. for success. That actually what that generally meant was the messages their core supporters already agreed with, like the NHS, were getting lots of attraction, but they weren't reaching out to the people they needed to win over. And obviously that's what you learned from so successfully. You said, I'm not we're not just going to do things for likes or clicks, we're going to target the people we need to win over who aren't in our natural coalition. Yeah, Chi, as a Labour MP, just moving it on ever so slightly, th the digital media revolution, it's a great process and platform of democratization isn't it isn't it a great leveler um absolutely and the digital media I mean, before i came into politics mm -hmm. i was an electrical engineer for 20 years helping build out these networks and the reason why i went into that is because anything something that gives people the power to connect with other people which enables people to reach out to share that is progress and that i believe is good for democracy but like any technology it comes with its disadvantages as well. And also, any technology, those in power will try and use it to reinforce, reinforce their power. And as they have the most means, they're the most likely to be able to use it most effectively to begin with. But you don't have to, you know, have lunch schmooze Rupert Murdoch to get your message out there anymore, because there are, there are other ways of doing it. Yeah. Let me say there's two really big caveats with that. And the first one, and that, that's the reason why I still do walk out on cold winter's days and knock on doors, is because there are millions of people in this country who still don't have broadband, who still don't yeah. have any digital yeah. access. Yeah. You know, at the state, a broadband mm. in this country mm. is a disgrace. And then there are those who may have access, but they can't afford it. It's too expensive, or they haven't got the digital skills necessary to use it. So there are millions of people off away from this, from this debate which we really need to include. And when we have included them, then we need to look at the way in which that debate and those messages are put, being put out. And what I would say particularly about, you know, and I really, I think it was a, it was a most effective campaign, uh, the Tory campaign in 2015 spent, I think it was, was it 10 times more than Labour on Facebook? Mm. But the other point is that those messages came with adverts down the sides. You know, and when, you know, when I am reaching out to my constituents, uh, and Facebook enables me to do that, and I do use that, but I'm very aware that if I'm asking them about how they feel about um, obesity or something, there's going to be adverts for, you know, well-known fast food places <laughs> down one side and there's going to be messages which are calculated on the basis of algorithms which are entirely you know invisible entirely mm -hmm. opaque which we have no knowledge of so w what i would say is we Hard need to just update people, the system feeds you with the system feeds you with things that they know you will like because of your your previous uh, clicking habits just to just to highlight that for people carry on yeah so we need we need so we need to update you know the regulations basically to make sure this fantastic uh, opportunity is fairer and is accessible to people and is used to support and enable people and not to feed them the same messages Regu ali you don't look happy the word regulations <laughs> yeah, my you, yeah. yeah um i think that i also think we may be giving a bit too much um, credit to social media and that the idea that um, political messages put out by parties simply fail because they weren't using the right social media strategy is perhaps masking a bigger problem and perhaps they were putting out 
uh, the wrong messages or messages that people weren't interested in. And when you brought up the, the fact of adverts being alongside uh, things on Facebook. And there is this sense that people kind of are just sort of mindlessly clicking on something and then they kind of, you know, pop up for McDonald's, comes up and they think, oh, yeah, I want McDonald's. And it's that kind of mindless. I think that's a very insulting view of the public, not only how they engage with news, but that's just with what media I said, in general. But, uh, but advertising is advertising for a reason because it does actually work. So, so that's... Well, and that's where Facebook gets its revenues from. No, so I'm not saying people are mindless, but I am saying that people are influenced by advertising. Otherwise, you wouldn't have quite such big budgets on it. No, absolutely. <laughs> but if you're, if you're putting out a message on obesity, let's say, for example, and then you're saying that there's a link between that and then a fast food uh, advertisement being alongside that, you're drawing a, some kind of relationship between them. And when, then when you use the word regulation, my alarm bells go off because I think, what do you want to regulate in that? Everything is right. You know, I'm going to come to you in a minute because that was quite a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, just this, it's this problem with the word regulation. Nothing is above the law. Or are you saying that the internet should be above the law? I mean, so th there are regulations that exist now. You recognise that we have a legal system. Yeah, I nothing's would disagree with some law. of those. Yeah, yeah, but nothing's above the law, so the law should apply. Yes, yeah. but in terms of free speech on the internet, it should be absolute. Mm. Oh, well, free speech on the internet, that's going to be a tasty area for us later on. That was, uh, you burst into a rapturous <laughs> solo round of applause yeah. there <laughs> what we, what, expand on it um, I, I just agree with the, the lady here I just think that um, it's very easy um, and I think it's a, cor a correct you know link between uh, advertising on social media and uh, problems that we face in society mm. now Jamie what about you mentioned Trump I think earlier on yep. what was was Trump's campaign a triumph of digital media in some ways, yes. I mean, of course, there are much bigger trends behind that. You can't yeah. just arrive and use Twitter and Facebook and then suddenly get yourself elected. You're obviously tapping into various uh, much deeper concerns that people have. But the point I want to make about that is when you are completely overwhelmed with different sources of information, this is the problem mm -hmm. uh, with uh, social media. Uh, we were promised in the 1990s from the digital profits that the politicians of the future, when we were all connected and we all had access to the world's information, would be more informed, they'd be smarter, and we'd all be kinder and nicer to each other. <laughs> One great academic even said it would be the end of nationalism because we'd be able to link to everybody and we'd all understand each other. And this is ludicrous. But the reality is, of course, that when we're overwhelmed with information, we use heuristics to try to quickly figure out what we think. Mm -hmm. We do tend, I think, I disagree slightly with you on this, Helen, that we do tend to find things that we already agree with, that our friends already ag agree with, and we trust that more. We do that and anyway. We do that anyway, but we do that to such a greater extent now than we ever did before, and we're less aware of it. Is that true, Helen? Well, it's, it, I, I think it's a tendency to present it as one thing or the other. I mean, it's a, it's a very grey area, you, you, you know, between... I, you even hear people talking about kind of hermetically sealed echo chambers, and that's... That, but people, that's say, oh, people say, oh, the Twitter sphere has gone mad. What they mean is their own Twitter feed <laughs> has gone yeah, mad. Yeah, but in almost any platform, you'll be able to see trending information, and mm. you just, you know, just, you're just one click away from a huge array of opinions. But, um, but the danger is, I think, that social uh, media politics is, in many ways, more angry, mm. more aggressive, more emotive. Mm. And, the danger, and the danger of that, I think, is that it makes compromise more difficult. The US Congress is more polarised than it's ever been, or since the war at the least. Uh, and I think that's happening in a lot of different democracies. And part of the reason is the way that we do now. Most of us, not everyone, but most of us engage with politics. That makes compromise more difficult. And I think that is going to make politics much more difficult but, in the future. But I think, look, our, all our societies have become more polarised, uh, where, you know, people, whether it be Trump in the United States, Brexit here, across Europe, the rise of the populist right, we've become far more divided as society. It's not obviously social media that's caused that. Social media is amplifying aspects of it, though, because people communicate on social media in a way they would often never dream of speaking to each other in real life. They often, it, it encourages a pack mentality, where you do get groups of people... It's like who, the mob in the French Revolution. But I don't want to get like that, because that does sound <laughs> kind of... Because it is good that it you can... can be, it's good you can democratise yeah. information, that lots of people can but make somebody their somebody says something, of. for example, on Twitter, and I, 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 got up, I was on holiday and I looked online on the, on the phone to see what was happening in the newspapers, and there were three stories of people who'd said something on Twitter and had had the fury 
uh, poured upon them for doing so and had to delete the tweets and had to apologise. Yeah. So is that really good for freedom of speech? No, that's, that's not, because you do end up with a situation now where basically people often, if they make a mistake or they say something which is obviously quite inflammatory or divisive, then a group on Twitter will basically coordinate and relish mm -hmm. taking yeah. that person yeah. down. Yeah. And they will throw yeah. everything at them. And if you're in the middle of a Twitter storm, John Ronson wrote an excellent book about this, yeah. about people yeah. shamed on Twitter. Yes, he did. It can be a terrifying experience where random strangers all over the world are yeah. suddenly screaming at yeah. you. It can be quite threatening and menacing. You even get a phenomenon, so-called doxing, where people will expose your personal information, go through your backstory, everything possible, try to get you sacked by your employer. So it can be very menacing. If and the mainstream newspapers feed off the back of it and have stories about that very thing happening and people being shamed for saying something that some of the papers reporting on it actually agree with. Yeah, well, I think that's the other problem because <laughs> this is the other issue, though, because we look at social media as though this is a new phenomenon, but there's a very long history of our very politicised media finding individuals who they disagree with, hunting them down, having reporters outside their front doors, uh, going through their private life, going through the private lives of people around them, so yes, we should hold social media to account, but we should also hold to account our mainstream media, which is responsible often for disseminating false news, for targeting individuals they don't agree with, and humiliating them. So yes, let's have that concern, but I think we should talk about our press as well, which is often out of control itself. OK, but, okay that, that's, that's something we'll skip onto in just a second. Is this good for freedom of speech, then, if people feel intimidated, uh, Jamie? No, I mean, there is always a... a I think there's a danger with social media, and I'm in favour of, I think social media and democracy work in some ways very well together, mm. and I, I think the positives do outweigh the negatives. There is definitely a sense, though, that a lot of people, and I feel it myself sometimes, of self-censoring, fearing to put something online that, yeah. <laughs> will I be attacked for that? Is it the right thing to do? And just avoiding the scandal, avoiding the mob, avoiding saying something that what, might cause what did, what did you want to say? Well, I, I'm not definitely not going to say <laughs> it now. Well, if I did, I might get some retweets and YouTube yeah, yeah. views and all yeah. the rest of it. So, but and that is a that is a danger, especially given that anything that you post stays online forever, and so you might be called up for something you did ten years ago, that is then waved in front of you and you lose your job or you have people complaining about you. And that's very, that has a real chilling effect because people will be afraid of ever speaking their mind. And Tom, is this something you take into account when you're employing people, for example? Do you have to look at their Facebook history and their... Absolutely, and, and we notice increasingly... It, for example, if you, a political party wants to use a, a real-life case study for uh, mm. a, a film, a party political broadcast, uh, mm. a poster campaign, etc., you would look into their background. And you find increasingly when you look at uh, people from a younger generation, when you look at their Facebook feeds, when you look at their Twitter feeds, they are saying stuff that kids aged 16, 17, 18 say, which, you know, when I was 16, 17, 18, I was saying stupid stuff as well. Or you find they will have liked something from Unilad or the Lad's Bible or something like mm. that, which we know that this is just part and parcel of being young and being a bit stupid and making mistakes, as we've all done. But taken out of context, suddenly it's, it blows up and becomes and a Now it's written in stone. Well, exactly, it? and I remember a case, um, I suspect others in the panels will know the details more, but uh, um, a youth police crime commissioner, I think she, she was in Birmingham, um, who had sort of put her head above the parapet for a Kent, job. I think, yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, put her head above the parapet for a job and then the, the press went over her tweets, as, as they are. You know, it's their, their right to do, and they found that she said some stupid stuff as we've all done, and suddenly she became the number one victim in the country, put, you know, the number one criminal in the country, they put her face all over the papers and she had to resign. Now, I'm not arguing the rights or wrongs about what she said, but increasingly now the things we say when we're younger are being hold, held against us because it's a permanent record online. Dan, you want to come in? I'll be with everyone. Well, I think the, these things are important, but uh, I'd like to get us on to fake news, which I think is a, I think is a cancer in, in the system. I mean, you know, the information is the lifeblood of democracy, and fake news is a terrible but thing. But Owen's saying fake news is nothing new. Well, we've seen the rise of it, but we've really seen the rise of it on social media oh. in the US. We've not had fake news in the mainstream People's, media? You know, the Pope supports Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, part of a paedophile ring. I mean, these things are nonsense, but they're very serious nonsense. And I but they're think, clearly nonsense, aren't they? Well, the thing is, I think that what we... You know, we've got an election coming up in three years' time. There is some evidence to suggest it's had an impact on the democratic process in America. I think we need to find ways of stopping that tide reaching these shores over the next three years. I, th pers I mean, although I think that uh, social media and the internet are fundamentally good for democracy, they disseminate information, they encourage participation, 
this fake news needs to be stamped out. But what, I think the responsibility yeah. for that lies with social media companies. But what's the difference I don't between... think they're being responsible enough about it, and I think they need to be called out on Okay, that. are they tech platforms or are they publishers? That's a, that's a very well, But the clue's in the title. They're social media platforms. Yeah. So I don't know why they're saying they're not media companies. On this fake news business, so, some of these fake news stories are so blatantly ludicrous. Surely most people must think, oh, for goodness well, but sake. We saw... But which is more insidious, that or some of the misreporting and misrepresentation and distortions that we've seen over the years from the mainstream media, which is more dangerous? Well, I think they're, they're both dangerous. Uh, there's a big, big difference between those two worlds, though, which is that, particularly for television, it's a much more regulated world. There are rules. There's a third-party independent regulator sure. who can investigate complaints. The, the, the social media is the Wild West. It is absolutely the Wild West, and that's a problem. But, oh, look, if back in 1984, during the miners' strike, a very divisive moment in British history, um, there was this infamous Battle of Orgreave, an infamous battle right in the, in the, in the you know, whole struggle. And the BBC, I'm afraid to say, at the time, they put the tape in a wrong direction because originally, as Liberty said, the human rights organisation was a police riot, the police had to pay compensation. And, and they put it in the wrong direction, the BBC, yet to apologise for it, incidentally, because, and, and made it look like the miners had attacked the police. The other example, yeah. infamously, is Hillsborough, where the Sun newspaper spread false news, fake news, about Liverpool fans with absolutely horrendous consequences. So we should take on fake news uh, on Two the Two big media. incidents over the last 20 years. The old media as but well. this happens every that. day on, on, on Twitter and the Twitter sphere and the digital media, fake but news But I think stories. often it will look, I mean, whether it be about immigrants, Muslims, unemployed people, benefit fraud, I think all of these are issues which are either exaggerated or distorted often as well by the mainstream press, which play into people's prejudices, where you end up, for example, with disabled people who've been, as disabled charities have said, abused on the streets yeah, as a consequence. Agree, yeah. That's because often... But of you the can complain to somebody, with the, as, as Dan says, with the so-called mainstream media, the MSM, you can complain. There well, is, again, I theoretically, th there's redress, isn't there? In theory, but I'm afraid to say, often the way the media operates in this country is that they often behave still... Uh, with impunity. You'll get corrections on page 22 in a tiny little box. So yes, obviously we take, we should take, I'm not saying we shouldn't take it seriously, absolutely we should do, should do that. False news, which is deliberately fake in order to play into the prejudices of very angry sections of the population. But right. I just I, don't I, think I, there's enough anger about the... Andrew, about I'm, the coming to, I'm coming to you, don't worry, because Andrew's got a lot to say on this and knows a lot about it, but Will is a fact checker. And we spend you must be a very busy man at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been a tough year. <laughs> <laughs> we spend our time not only checking what people are saying, be they politicians, be they journalists, be they lots of other people in public life, but also asking them to go and correct the record. But it's not just mischievous, this stuff. It's malicious, isn't it? It's deliberate and it's malicious. It's not for me to judge that. It's for everyone in this room to judge that. If we're concerned about the effect of information on democracy, we've got to remember that we are democracy. Mm. It is all of us as voters who decide whether digital media is going to be good for us or bad for us. But I think the thing we've got to look at is who has power and are they using it fairly? Are people who are in powerful positions using information to mislead us? And if so, what are we going to do about it? And Owen is right that there are lots of examples of mainstream media outlets publishing things that are clearly not true. In our experience... And getting clobbered for it eventually. Sorry? And getting clobbered for it eventually. Um, well, clobbered this, is... This stuff is round the world in 80 it, clicks, isn't it? And it's, you know... Clobbing, it's, clobbered is putting it far too strongly. Very <laughs> few mainstream media outlets have any kind of system where people get clobbered for getting things wrong. No, that's that. not, that's it's, simply not true in television. In, in There's television, a very clear it, set of rules. To, There's a third-party independent regulator who polices that. You can complain. To, to, things are investigated. And ultimately, if you're a, if you're a repeat offender, you have your licence revoked. Rever well, A, when did that last happen in a major, well, but I major media programme? Some of the, Secondly, some of the news, is, as you some said, of the news channels really sail close to the wind and they get called on this stuff by, by the regulator and they have to amend their behaviour, and they do. T television, as you said, is the most regulated and it's absolutely right that they have the strongest kind of set of rules around accuracy and greatest caution. It's nonetheless the case that at least one of them has the informal slogan of never wrong for long. We'll get it on air as quickly as possible and we'll correct it if we need to. Um, television and radio have very strong rules. Newspapers, which are highly partisan, don't have the same rules. They have a whole range of things. Some of them will correct things very quickly 
and very fairly when we ask them to. And I Some think of them will simply ignore corrections requests. Uh, I, so there's a whole range of stuff how going is it, How long does it take to, it's, to I check a fact? How long does it take to check a fact? Usually about a day. A day? To turn around a really solid fact check where you've looked at all the sources, you've talked to experts where you need to. Where well, you can say, give it's been around the world uh, uh, twice uh, <laughs> on the exactly digital so. media by the time so you've the checked thing, a fact. So the thing that really matters isn't actually whether media outlets get things wrong once. It's how often things get repeated, because yeah. that's what's yeah. really powerful. Yeah. So if they do correct things when we point it out or when someone else points it out, that can do a lot of good, but not all of them do it consistently. Now, let's talk about social media for a minute, because there are kind of two things going on with social media. <coughs> One is that all of us can share whatever we want with whoever we want, and that's amazing. That's democracy writ large. And if you don't like the consequences, then change your voters. Um, I, it's up to all of us to do a better job as voters. <laughs> the other bit is people in positions of power, be they the social media companies or be they the advertisers on social media, using that platform either fairly to the users or unfairly. Now, the thing we don't know when the political parties spend hundreds of thousands, millions, I don't know, advertising, is what they are saying and to whom. It has never, ever been possible before to reach millions of people in this country and have the other millions of the people in the country not know. You couldn't take out a newspaper advert and have the rest of us not see it. So now we have a whole set of political advertising that is completely unscrutinised. And that's the thing that I think we should be, well, be a bit worried I think about. Dan's Social agreeing with media you on, is invisible to the rest of us. I think it's the uh, fact that it's unscrutinised is, is basically <laughs> Dan's point. <laughs> Dr <laughs> Andrew Calcutt, <laughs> if I can may. I just make a point you can about, in a minute. Can, about trust. You can because, in a minute. I'll come back the, to trust. I'll come back to trust. Because the trust rules. me, I won't come <laughs> back to it. But, uh, or I'll apologise. <laughs> Uh, but Andrew hasn't been in yet, if I may, and I know Laura, I've got to come to you yet. I think everyone's had a say and we'll have far more of a say. But Andrew, um, journalism, humanities and creative industries, that's your thing, yep. do as, a, as a Dr Andrew Calcott. In this, we, we're on false news, we're on fake news now, but in this, in this cacophony of calumny <laughs> and falsehood, is the truth dying? Well, I think the idea that um, democracy is threatened and truth is destroyed by a bunch of spotty youth from Macedonia. Um, coming <laughs> folk. It's just ludicrous. And equally risible is the, the CIA, of all people, complaining about state agencies interfering in the business of other sovereign nations. I mean, you can, couldn't make it up. I think, though, that... Um, I think some of my fellow panellists are really trying to do the jigsaw by just the first couple of pieces that come to hand. Um, and I think, really, if we l take a step back and look at that question, uh, it's kind of too early to tell whether social media or uh, uh, digital media are good for democracy, because we're not in one. We're not in a democracy. We're in an era of something like zombie politics. So if I may, it's a little bit like, was it, was it Deng Xiaoping? Was it when asked yeah, about the, to tell, the French right? Revolution? Is it, and he said, yeah. did it work? It's too early to tell. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a I because don't know if it was Deng, but it's a little bit like that. We're, we're in an era of zombie politics where uh, the majority population is noticeable by its absence. And yeah. um, professional politicians have been like a kind of medicine show, spooning out uh, what the majority population is supposed to accept. And you're meant to just take your medicine, and if you don't take it, um, you're decried as being a deplorable. And guess what? Uh, in the last year, uh, major sections of that population have said, we're not going to be the studio audience mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. We're going to walk out on that scenario. And so, with all due respect, I think a lot of people sitting around the inner circle are indeed in the inner circle. They're in the bubble. That is, we are the problem. <laughs> that, is, that is rather far removed from where most people are. And most people are not, in any substantial sense, engaged in, in but, politics. But if there's a lack the of idea trust. that this kind of interpersonal details uh, amounts to political polarisation is just ludicrous. Put your hand up in the audience if you want to say something on this and I'll, I'll get round you. But if you say that people are disillusioned with politics because of a lack of trust, we are now playing around with this platform which has uh, stuff on it that we cannot trust. In there is a paradox somewhere, Dan, isn't there? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in this question of, you know, rules and regulations because the, the most regulated part of the media is television. 
um, it is, and we've got this diverse public service system in the UK, um, and that is policed by Ofcom, and lo and behold, people's biggest source of news in the UK, at least, is television, and it's also the most trusted. Um, social media, I mean, at the moment, is much, much lower, both in terms of the amount, number of people that do access it for news, but also for its levels of trust. The, the problem Same is that you've got... the by the way. The problem is you've got, you've got this, this issue of fake news, and we have to stamp it out before it gets bigger. Too late. It's not. It's not too late. But there's no such thing as fake news and not fake news, and it's clear to determine which is which. I mean, it's, it's well, such are, uh, a big grey area between one and the other, and every single There, there may be, there. but... Stamping but, it out is censorship. But, but, aren't our lives no, micromanaged enough already? I mean, a, I mean, you, know, you have to regulate everything out of existence. We, uh, we have to bring up the elephant in the room here, in, in which is that what no-one wants to admit is that the idea of the fear of fake news is the fear of who is reading that fake news and what will they do with that information. And essentially when you say that there is a danger of people being influenced by fake news negatively, you're making a differentiation between you who can understand that the news is fake and kind of those vicos out there who can't. And that's a no, deeply, deep, hang on, that's a deeply insulting thing. If you, think, if you think fake news should be stamped out, who do you want to stamp it out and why should they be the arbiters of truth? And how do you stamp it out? Exactly. Well, I think that's complicated, and I, and I, but I think it... <laughs> that's the easy answer, no, really no, uncomfortable no, no, but I question. Think, but look, the horse but, is bolted. But you have, different, you have different systems within different media. And, you know, television is heavily, heavily regulated. It didn't stop television keep holding power to account, generally being extremely accurate, being diverse and being popular. But can I it, ask it you why you're that. worried about... Why, why are you so worried that people... Uh, and, I mean, I don't know who you're talking about when you're talking about people who don't understand that a wild story about Ed Miliband fixing relationships with Hillary Clinton is fake. Well, um, BuzzFeed's you know, I mean, who, Buzz who Buzz Buzz research showed that there was more consumption of fake news during the US election yeah. Than true news. It's just, like, I mean, that's people a, have that is going to be a people problem. Having a laugh. Can I ask that's a can problem. I, can I ask a question, just as a hypothetical? If someone, say, if, if something completely fake about you went all over the world, like someone claimed you were the head of a drugs cartel, something to you obviously <laughs> ridiculous, yeah. that went all around the world, thousands of people, they don't know you from Adam, they don't know who you are, and your picture is there calling you the head of a drug cartel, you'd be like, no correction needed, free speech, they can say what I want, what they want. I, would you be comfortable with that, I would, genuinely? I would suppose I would publicly say that that isn't the case. Um, Couldn't that put you at risk? It would put, it's the cost of having a free society is people being allowed to say whatever they want, and sometimes that being untrue, sometimes that being nasty. But you wouldn't want it stamped that out, That is the though. cost of a free I'm society. Gonna, I'm going to take that, I'm going to take that thought, that people being able to say whatever they want, and we're going to discuss it in the context of the digital media, but first of all, as promised, what would you like to say? Yeah, thank Hello. you. <clears throat> what I'm, I want you to say was that this particular issue about news, whether where they are coming from, is mm -hmm. not the responsibility of one side, it's the responsibility of the receivers, us general public as well, to find it out where is it coming from, if we can't get to right to the bottom of it, at least do a little bit of research or investigation of our own. Nowadays, it's not only TV, as somebody said, it's mostly the free newspapers on the train. That's the time we have to just listen and digest. Now, this, even if we take simple rules, uh, golden rules, now this particular rule I'm saying is coming from a Muslim community, is a saying of Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, a basic saying, a hadith, that for a person to be a liar is enough that he passes on whatever he just hears without making any effort to check. So if everybody takes just this simple basic rule only, we'll, we'll avoid so much of spreading around just a news which we heard on a WhatsApp or rumors, Facebook or gossip. rumors. That's it, yeah. Yes. And, uh, the Hadith are very strong against rumors and backbiting. So if, if everybody that, sticks to that rule, so much, yeah. so much will be relieved, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely That's actually right. a really smart point. And it's a really it's good best point thing so to hear, far. you know, as a yeah. fact checker, it's lovely to say that say we so. can use fact checking to empower <laughs> everybody. The thing you've got to ask, the flip side of the question of, you know, who's the, the person who can, you know, split the difference between all of those stupid people who believe all the fake news and the rest of us. Actually, none of us can just skim through a set of headlines and know which of them is true or not. It's immensely difficult to spot people who are trying to mislead you and people who aren't. We want to, so we, things we like the thrills and the wrong. spills and the excitement of, oh, what, what if that's true? That's great. Exactly. It's a completely different set of personal standards we apply to that than we do to watching TV news or radio news. But you can't, never mind splitting the difference, here's somebody who made a difference. <laughs> Laura, your campaign and the tampon tax. And that was through social media, wasn't it? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I think one of the main really good points about social media is that it really gives power to underrepresented communities of people, like women, for example. So, like, tampon tax has existed since 1973, um, and people have campaigned for generations to end tampon tax. Um, but the reason why this campaign finally won, at least I think anyway, is because we've had this platform of social media that we've never had before. And upon that platform, we can finally really be heard and like politicians can't necessarily ignore us anymore. Um, so I think that's one really, really good, like an important point of social media that individuals can really use it rather than like political parties or maybe like news outlets. Like it gives the individual back power and then communities that are underrepresented power as yeah. well. Yeah, there's loads of examples. Yeah. Things I'm interested in, the whole pressure on SeaWorld in Florida with the, uh, the, the you know, Black the, Lives Matter campaign. Yeah, the, the Black Lives Matter campaign, your campaign. But it's not just a click, isn't it? Because it's yeah. what you were saying earlier on, Helen. It's a million clicks or <coughs> exactly. it's 100,000 click clicks, whatever up. it is. Yeah. The clicks scale up to yeah. something really significant. Also, like people don't just click and then do nothing else. Or they don't just like scroll through. Exactly. And people mm. don't just scroll through, like Change.org, for example, and just like click on every single petition they don't I get people emailing me every single day with like little spelling errors that I've made that I've not even seen <laughs> so they definitely do like read through your campaigns and we also have like lots of communities throughout the world really um, that have bound together and really made a difference within their community whether that be through tampon tax or the new campaign about homeless people and improving sanitary provision to homeless women like lots of people do stuff physically that's inspired did you by get any government. abuse and vile trolling as yes. a result of your campaign? I did. I think, like, especially as a woman or, like, a feminist campaigner online, mm. um, you're just open to that, which is really sad. But, like, I found that online trolling is actually a really important form of sexism that I've, like, incurred anyway, in that it's really obviously documented and it's evidence to show that, like, sexism really does exist. Shocking. And it's, yeah, it shocks people. But, like, women face sexism on an everyday basis. Not like and that. And lots of people basically say, oh, sexism doesn't exist. Like, we have never experienced it as men, for example, so therefore it doesn't... But some of that like stuff it. is psychotic. It's not just, you know... <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, it's just evidence of feelings that are, like, evident throughout society. And if that comes out online, that's, in a way, a good thing because it shows that sexism really doesn't exist and we need to tackle it. It's lifted up the stone. What yeah. about so many female MPs of, from all sides of the, uh, of, of the chamber of the political divide have had some... Absolutely, dreadful, absolutely dreadful vile. stuff. And, 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 What's that about? What's going on? I think it's about... I mean, it's, sort of the, it's the power of the network that you're talking about with the tampon tax, you know, and, and networks before were, you know, old boys' networks, or they were for the powerful, whereas now we can have networks for, for everyone to come together. But as well as that, that attracts. And I think what the internet does really well is amplify what is in people's... what was out there in the debate. So it attracts those who are the most vocal and the most aggressive to take part in the debate. And what I really dislike, and I know about you, is this idea that if you respond to that, you are feeding the trolls. You know, I think that women have to have, uh, women and everyone needs to put their voices out there and we need to take back yeah. that space. We need to take back the internet space. And what I would, what I would say is that, again, you know, to come, that's why we need a more active, uh, government um, setting we need it's too early to tell I agree what the impact of digital media on democracy but we need to decide what that impact is more active we government this, what do you mean well I, we need we need a government for example is looking at this it, the issue is protecting um, f free speech but also against hate speech online for example but if you were to meet one of these people and very often oh Owen <laughs> did you know they, they're not very impressive human beings some of these people they're pretty sad individuals they, but they're you know they become these sort of keyboard warriors and as Owen said earlier on they say things to you that would, they would never say to your face that's not representative it's just brought out a sense of it's empowered it's, it's some em rather pathetic people well I'm, I'm, it's empowered if you like the wrong people but there needs to also be sanctions <laughs> it needs to be sanctions and this is the point about internet no, it's, it's empowered the wrong people it's empowered the wrong people when they're attacking and trolling yes, yes and, and there needs to be sanctions and i'm very interested the, the idea that you don't that you don't believe there should be sanctions online for the sort of behavior which in the street if somebody attacked me in mm. the street in the way they do online there would be sanctions and what i'm saying is that regulation that applies in real life applies also Hello. online i shouldn't 
I don't think there should be any sanctions on, on speech in real life or anyone else. You, you know, the, the phrase empowering the wrong people is so terrifying to hear from an elected MP. I mean, that is just shocking to me because what this is really masking, and the, in, the question about women is so interesting because so often censorship online is couched in terms of protecting women, protecting minorities. And what that basically is saying is that women cannot handle um, really sometimes quite awful um, <laughs> abuse online as well as men. To me, that's, we, that's deeply... It really stops women that putting is, their head above the parliament wanted to stand for parliament if for example. A, if you are a, hang on hang on if you are a public figure and if you if you're a public figure especially if you're an mp you should be able to accept that you are talking to the public and the public should be allowed to talk to you now sometimes that's particularly nasty actually the majority of um so-called sex abuse that mps get and i'm thinking about certain mps who are very vocal about it jess phillips yvette cooper is actually just criticism of of them but hang on if somebody sometimes came to your constituency criticism. surgery and said i think you should i would i think you should be raped you wouldn't say, hang on a minute, I'll be with you in just a second. Yeah, you know. so, is that what you're saying? There are, no, there's, 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 so, there are so things like death, that they're, they're empowered, death threats and uh, things like that that are clearly illegal should be uh, <laughs> dealt with through law. But what we're really talking about now is a broader question about what no, is no, sexist. No, 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 what is not. sexist? And actually, what, what is what talked not? about is saying stuff like, I mean, uh, you know, I've written on this a lot about what is sexist trolling, and it's often like calling women fat or calling, saying horrible things about women. Uh, and that is, that is seen, especially with the tampon text, that is seen to... Men Jamie, yeah. where are you on I don't this? think so. Jamie, where, where? Just, just to uh, say, that, just finally, just I'm, to say yeah. that women are... Just, sorry, to say it's that right. women are more subject to online abuse and that they, there should be sanctions to protect women is deeply more sexist than anything in online control. How do we stop yeah, this? Can we stop it? We, should we stop no, it? We can't stop it and we shouldn't stop all types of trolling and we shouldn't no. stop all types of offensive uh, language or behaviour because when we live in a society, as, and we've talked about it, where people are slightly worried about self-censoring, not being able to speak their mind. Actually, sometimes internet trolls play quite a valuable role. They push at the boundaries of offensiveness and they make other people feel like they might be able to speak their mind too. Yes, of course, there are limits to that where it gets particularly targeted or where it's a threat against an individual. But there's always a danger, I think, that with internet trolls, we just say, oh, they're, all, you know, they're terrible, we've got to silence them all. That would actually be yeah. quite detrimental for the health I, of our democracy. I, I think oh, do they have their uses? What, trolls? Yeah, it's just... Well, we conflate, I think, trolls and abuse, and that's the... Look, I get trolled all the time about, you know, I look like a 12-year-old. I mean, some age better than others, what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> the same you time... wrote an article of... I, I, if I may say it was provocative, <laughs> but it was pretty, as most of your articles can be, uh, pretty thoughtful and, and well-argued about the fact <laughs> that having Jeremy Corbyn as leader might not be the best idea in the world and it was interesting and I, I watched it happen I, it's, it unfolded in front of me like a like a fight in the schoolyard you weren't behaving in that manner but other people were the abuse you got was extraordinary well, you know, I'm a right wing seller as my mum would tell me no, I'm joking I, I, I think what, there's that, not much room for civilised debate sometimes no but I there? would say this actually because yes I have had that kind of attack and mm. it, it seems ridiculous but I, I think we've had a lot of focus on that but m the vast majority of abuse I get is from the far right and the hard right and that is stuff like threats of violence, threats of death, sharing my home address, sharing pictures from Google Street View of my bedroom and my front door with arrows pointing at them saying, here's where he, his bedroom, here's, here's his door. Now, if you're saying an absolute view on free speech, which is people have the right to say that I should be chopped up because I'm gay, that people online should, you know, it doesn't, I don't take it seriously, I should say. Some of my friends think I should take it far more seriously than I do, but nonetheless, that in the, in the interest of free speech, people can basically issue hate. So what do we do about it? And hate. Well, it should be. When Over to in, you. In the real world, if someone says to you, you should, you know, you're It's not a, the real world. It is the real world, world online, of course it is. It is. And, and I have to say, in the, after the death of Joe Cox no, by yeah, a far-right yeah, terrorist, yeah. we yeah. should take far more seriously the sort of hate speech we see online, and it legitimizes often the sorts of extremism that kind of end up. There you are. That's yeah. where it ends yeah. up, Ella. Andrew, in a no, second. No, I don't think it necessarily ends up in the tragic death of, of Joe Cox, which was not through a kind of social media hate campaign. It, that was not the, what happened. It's not what I said. that tragedy. Like, well, right. but the thing is, what you know, the left used to be about protecting people's freedoms and arguing for people's freedoms, and right now, I mean, a lot of the kind of trolling online comes from, as we've said, sort of. Yes, right-wing sados who are keyboard warriors, and they really wouldn't threaten a mouse, let alone, you know, women or, or anyone else. Left-wing sados as well, but if I can, for the sake yes, of BBC from, impartiality. It comes from it comes from both sides, but we used to, uh, you know, on the left, we used to argue for freedom and absolute freedom, and the freedom for somebody to be able to say and express themselves um, in any way, and that's actually now the biggest kind of argument against 
uh, free speech, which is an, an absolute right in a free society. If you don't have free speech, you don't have recourse to any kind of freedoms because it's the fundamental right to say what you believe. And the left is now trying to close that down but through sanctions, Andrew, wait a through minute. sanctions and through yeah. censorship uh, Andrew, and through rules. Dr Andrew Calcutt, is this, is this just a necessary uh, or unavoidable consequence of the digital media platforms? Is it just uh, an, a manifestation of aspects of the human condition? Or is it something that we should stamp on? Oh, I certainly don't think we uh, should be stamping and regulating things out of existence. Not by any means. Um, I, 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 th I think it would just be ludicrous to try and close it down mm. and um, sanitise it and um, outlaw the deplorables. It's, you know, it's the same kind of... Hillary Clinton discourse all over again. You shouldn't be allowed to say that. We don't want you even in the echo chamber. But what, um, Andrew, what about, and this is something we'll come back to Dan, because I mean, Dan mentioned this earlier on. I think somebody else did too. Seems an awful long time ago. Are, uh, Facebook and Twitter, are they tech platforms or are they publishers? Well, they're something like a hybrid in between the two. But, I, you know, I don't, I don't think they are either the problem or the solution. Mm. I think we've lived through decades of intense interpersonalization, privatization of everyday life, uh, mixed in with a kind of post political managerial elite that wants to micromanage every aspect of our existence, including what we do on online. And um, I don't think the, the, that. The, well, I don't think forgive me, that's. Dan, you want to let Dan come back on uh, that? Oh, I don't think anyone's saying. I, mean, I would imagine. Well, of course, you're not going to I, say. I would it, imagine you? everyone on this because, panel wants because it, I'm wants revealing to have what you a, don't want to say. A society of free speech in this country, and I believe yeah, well, that we have it. Yeah, well, they all say that. But, Come but on. But, but, <laughs> but it's a, free total utter, yeah. a total and utter free for all ignores the fact that there are other aspects of existence that also have importance. We're not talking about micromanaging that out of existence. We're just talking about having creating an environment where there's some basic <laughs> decency. Creating an environment means. Managing Managing it. Awesome. One of the yeah, best but, things but, about but the original have that. incarnation of the we internet. We already have that was in the our media. Electronic <laughs> Frontier Foundation, which saw it as a frontier for experimentation yeah. and people breaking but out. But we already and have that in the world differently. of television what you and want to radio and sanitise it. Dan, Dan, be Dan, be Dan as a channel why, why format, are you not? Wait a minute, everybody, please, I, or I'll unfollow you all. <laughs> <laughs> as a as a as a as a TV man, as a channel four man. Are you not uh, slightly on the defensive here? Because you're old news, and this is all. This is all the next. This is what's happening now. No. It's going to happen in the future. Because uh, TV news, Channel Four news, great program. Sky News, they do a wonderful job. BBC, a ITN, likewise. But don't they all look a little bit leaden-footed? Uh, no, I now? don't think that's right. Actually, I mean, I don't think that is a sort of uh, a view of what is actually happening. So, you know, as I said earlier, television is the main source of news for most people. Um, but the traditional media companies, Channel 4 included, the BBC included, have done an incredible job of going into the new world and distributing video-based news. You know, Channel 4 News is now the biggest British broadcaster putting news into, into Facebook. But I think you've done a deplorable job on, on telling the story of what's been going on in Western societies for the last 20, 30 years. That's why you didn't get that people were going to vote for Brexit. That's why the mainstream media didn't get that people were going to vote that's, for Trump that's in the as way much they did, a thing about politics. you haven't covered the story. I, I think, think, sorry, just to, just to complete algorithm. on that point, I think the important thing to say about the old media going into the new media space is that we, the BBC, the other public service broadcasters, we, we apply the standards that exist in the television world, which are much higher, and in the UK are the gold standard in the world in any form of media, we apply those standards into a world where other people aren't applying it. That's not to say that internet-only players don't have terrifically high standards. Some of them do. People like Huffington Stop. Post. I think you're but covering there are many, yourself in medals you don't deserve. But there are many who like don't. like self-service broadcasting. But there are many who don't. Service. Andrew's on fire now. I can't. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting points, though. Interesting points. Self-service broadcasting. That's, that's quite a... Uh, Jamie. What? You've been listening. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know about this stuff. <laughs> well, the reality is, I think, that... Um, the world is getting the bad. Far, well, it's getting far more unstable and unpredictable, and that's also very exciting. I mean, we definitely mm. need to reinvigorate our democracies. We need new ideas. Do we need uh, new political... controls? 
the more we what can about Facebook? What about Twitter? Aren't they, are they publishers, essentially, aren't they? Shouldn't they be doing more? If they are judged as publishers, I mean, they have an opt-out under 1995 legislation in the US, which means they're not responsible for things that are published on their platform. Because if they were, they would probably collapse immediately because they'd have to check everything before it was posted. And we're talking about millions, billions I, of you pieces You could go on right now, you could find... It's not possible you could find to do. IS, you can find vile Islamism, it, you can find vile not, Nazism, and, you can find Holocaust But it's not possible for them to actually check everything all mm. the time as no, posted. They, it's simply but they, too yeah. much. But they have a moral imperative to do significantly more than they are doing. At the moment, they, they, are, they have immense power as companies and they are simply not... Well, exercising not enough, enough responsibility. I, I think we're mixing up two things, or Dan, really, with respect, I think you're mixing up two things. One is that we all, are, as individuals, are on social media. And what we do as individuals is our business, and everyone else can mind theirs. There are also lots of people publishing on social media who are organisations, who are doing what used to be only the remit of proper journalists with proper, hopefully proper journalistic standards. Um, and obviously, as a professional journalist who lives by those standards, you're offended to see people purporting to do that and not living up to those standards. Those are the people you have a beef with, and I think we need to be... No, I'm a, a bit... I have a beef with people who are outright lying and also people who are doing it for their own, simply for their own financial ends. Yeah, Helen, before we even yeah. get to political the, influence. Helen, I haven't heard from you for a while. The point is that, that social media platforms are now, to some extent, kind of institutions of democracy, if you like. I mean, they are where our democracies are played out. They're where our campaigns take place, where our elections take place, where our governments act, where the president-elect is actually making policy and but they've only been there for about five years they've only been around at all for ten and they've only been kind of intertwined with our political systems for five so I suppose it's not surprising that we've got a lot of institutional catch-up to do but there are things we can do and there are things that be being done I mean not enough and it's too late etc but we shouldn't just throw our hands in the air and give up yeah. Twitter yeah. And, and we shouldn't lump everything together we're lumping together fake news um, trolls you, you know the small yeah. the small very small number of people who are threatening to close down Twitter entirely and right now um, this is Helen this is a this is a fantastic debate but out there there is a an even more fantastic debate about this debate happening right now yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. only yeah. they could all... Well, that's we, right. We even say, this debate yeah. about politics is being played out on social media as yeah. we speak, exactly. But, but the solutions to the things are different as well. The solutions to fake news are, uh, are things like your organisation and, and uh, what Facebook have said they will do about fake news, both they themselves in terms of fake jacking and allowing individual pe social media users to report, you know, um, and, and the solutions are different for, for, for trolls are, uh, and they are different for all, all the other things that we've been talking about. But they, they are, there are possibilities out there and they are being worked at. There are even bots being developed, anti-racist bots. Just bots. to explain to people who don't know what a bot is. Well, like, an automated Twitter right. account, for example. There are, there, yeah. there, there, there are automated Twitter accounts that are out there facing racism and uh, 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 attacking of racism or, or just trying to persuade um, uh, uh, racist trolls um, uh, 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 of, of the error of their ways, etc. And, and some of those things are being shown to, to, to work. Hmm. So there are a lot of possibilities out there, but we can't just lump them all so together. So, Chi, we're getting towards the end, but is it... We've got about a 40-second answer from you, if, you, <laughs> if we would. Is this... Uh, do you celebrate this? In, is it a better form of contact with your constituents as a, an, a, an elected representative? I celebrate it as an elected representative in terms of being able instantly almost to see some constituents, those who are on Twitter or those who are on, feed, on Facebook's response to really important issues. That is fantastic um, online. But I also recognise that there are so many who aren't making those responses because a lot of people have better things to do with their lives than respond to their MPs online. But also, and I think we haven't talked about this, the rules that Facebook and others do in order to decide what you see, okay. the algorithms, uh, they are what control. And after what this goes sees. out, we're all going to check our phones, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed.